series, Meet the Author series, showcases authors writing about current issues, gives us an opportunity to hear about them and to discuss with authors some of those issues. And uh, we'd like to encourage you, if you haven't already, to find out more about the library supporter program that helps these events take place. And there's literature on that subject at the back of the room. Okay, so today we're going to hear about a fascinating new book. Um, Manisha Thakur is the co-author of On My Own Two Feet, A Modern Girl's Guide to Personal Finance. Actually, I've just had a look at this book. If you haven't seen it yet, it's actually more than a guide to personal finance. Like Moby Dick is more than a fisherman's manual. It's, uh, uh, from the inspection I gave it, it looks more like a a penetrating insight into the whole psyche of 21st century Western woman, which is a subject I'm deeply interested in because I have a 28-year-old daughter. So, okay. Um, but Manisha will tell you more about this and her subject matter. She lives in Houston, Texas with her husband. She's had an, already had an extensive career in financial analysis and investment management. Uh, from which I'm sure she has learned to look deep into the souls of both man and womankind. So her BA was in American Studies from Wellesley. She has an MBA from Harvard Business School. Manisha, the floor is yours. Let me pass this over to you. Okay. Fantastic. And thank you all so much for waiting. I am so sorry. My, my co-author and I, um, we wrote on my own two feet because we wanted to give back to the community and we realized we weren't really Habitat for Humanity folks or soup kitchen folks, but we did have a skill that was useful, which is telling women about money. This is the kind of day I'm having. Um, and so we do this in between um, our paying day jobs and I had a client meeting that ran super late out in Wellesley which is why I'm so late getting here so thank you. What I thought I would do today is uh, a couple of things. Um, my main goal is to put a bug in your ear and the bug that I want to put in your ear is this that if you do a few simple things right with your money in your 20s, your 30s and your 40s you literally can put yourself on the path to financial nirvana. And so what I want to do here today is tell you what those things are. Um, but perhaps even more importantly, I want to inspire you to act on them because while the steps to achieving financial success are fairly straightforward, just like sticking to a diet or exercise program, what really will make the difference between success and failure is the motivation to carry through when the going gets tough. So of everything that I say here today, maybe my introductory comments might be the most important because those are the ones you can reflect back on when the inevitable um, air bumps of life hit your days. So without further ado, I'd like to start off by asking you to kind of think back to the last time you were with a group of people of uh, varying ages. And it could be at a restaurant or at a wedding or at the movie theater. And kind of think what people looked like, what they were saying, how they were acting, uh, what they were wearing. And think about how you felt in return. And then I want to tell you a statistic that every time I say it kind of shocks me, which is if that was an average slice of America, seven out of every 10 people that you were just envisioning are living paycheck to paycheck. And you may think, oh, no, no, not the wedding I was at, not the restaurant I was at, not the movie theater I was at. And the answer is, yeah. I mean, the statistic is stunning. If all Americans got financially naked, we'd be horrified at what we saw. It, this statistic cuts across economic spectrum. Um, my co-author, who's also my best girlfriend and I, we, we both work in the money management industry and I cannot tell you how many people we've may, met that make six-figure incomes and even over a million dollars and they're still living paycheck to paycheck. Because if you spend all that you make, it doesn't matter how much you make, you're in the same boat, whether that's 25000 250000 or $2.5 million. So in terms of introductory comments, there are really three broad points that I want to make. And the first one is this. The next time you see a guy cruise by in a shiny new sports car, or you see a gal trotting around in their hot new designer jeans with that great handbag, the odds are pretty darn high that that external image may not bear a lot of resemblance to their inner financial reality. And the statistics bear it out as a nation, our savings rate is zero. Less than 40% of us have ever tried to budget, let alone succeeded. 
The average credit card debt outstanding in America is over $9,000. Um, and for those people who only make the minimum monthly payment, it's actually over $13,000. So the first point is, things aren't always as it seems when it comes to looking at external images. Second point, contextually, is that it's not that people want to make bad decisions. Um, Sharon, my co-author and I, we've never met anyone who said, you know, I'd like to screw up my financial life. Um, what, what happens is personal finance isn't taught. It's one of those things like parenting that we're just sort of expected to pick up as we go along the way. But unlike parenting, personal finance is one of those things that society doesn't encourage us to be really open about acknowledging any degree of, of lack of knowledge or confidence. Um, it really is, in a sense, the pink elephant in the room. And as a result, millions of Americans literally are, are truly financially clueless, and yet we're not letting each other know and so one of the things Sharon and I are trying to really encourage people to do is pipe up. And if you have a question, I promise you, you know, 10 other people around you have the same question. The final thing contextually about money that I want to highlight is, you know, the book we wrote is called On My Own Two Feet, A Modern Girl's Guide to Personal Finance. And you know, a lot of people say, well, why did you focus on ladies? Is it because women are worse with money? And the answer is absolutely not. It, Financial literacy, or lack thereof, is a, a major issue for both genders. The reason we focused on it for women is because, statistically speaking, we're the ones left holding the bag. So here's another stat that every time I say, I'm like, oh my god. Um, but believe it or not, 80% of men die married. 80% of women die single. And the men may say, we're killing them off, but it's not true. Um, it's because of higher divorce rates and women have statistically longer lifespans. And the problem is the bag that us ladies are left carrying right now is not such a pretty one. So for two-thirds of women over age 65 right now, two out of every three women you meet today over age 65, meager social security payments are their primary source of income, which in plain English means they are literally choosing between food and essential medicines, and it doesn't have to be that way. So our whole goal with this book is to try and highlight um, for everyone, but particularly for us ladies, that if you do three simple things, save, invest, and protect, you literally can put yourself on the path to financial nirvana and avoid becoming one of those statistics. And the good news is it's never too late to start. Earlier is better. But you know, every one of us in this room, odds are, if we're in the room right now, there are pretty decent statistical um, studies showing that we could live well into our 90s. And so uh, while the, the things that I'm talking about are most powerful when applied in your 20s and 30s, at any age, you can jump on and, and start these steps. So that's kind of the, the, the big picture. Um, the only other thing I want to say contextually is I want to be really clear that women aren't approaching the subject of money from a position of weakness. Because never in history have women had as much professional and political power as, as we do today. And you, know, you think about who's Speaker of the House, who's running Germany, who's running for president, you know, women. Um, think about Pepsi or eBay, huge multinational companies, who's running them? Women. Um, so the point is simply that it's time that we embrace our power when it comes to our personal finances as well. So that's the background. In terms of the three steps, I'm going to spend the most time on savings, because um, that's the one everyone can do, even if you think you can't do it. I'm going to try and convince you that you can. Then we'll talk about investing, which is the next step, and we'll wrap with protecting. Um, and if anybody has questions as we go along, don't hesitate to jump in. Um, I probably should have been a New Yorker, not a Texan, because I talk this fast all the time, even when I'm not running late. So also, if anyone needs me to slow down, don't hesitate to, my dad does this to me, slow down. Um, in terms of savings, there are a couple of messages that I want to get to you, give to you. The first is why you need to save to begin with. Um, the second is um, what you're saving for. Um, the third is, and I, the PowerPoints are for some, uh, uh, items that I'll refer to from time to time, but I'm mostly just going to talk off the cuff. Um, so I'm going to talk about why you need to save, or uh, what, what you're saving for, how much you should save, and what to do if you think you can't find any money to save. So the good news is the whole reason you save money is so you can spend it. 
Um, that's the good news, and I'm, I'm really serious about that. You, you don't save money just to squirrel it away. You save it so that at some point down the road, you, you can spend it. And so when you can start thinking that saving isn't about deprivation, it's just about delayed gratification, that can help. Um, if you save for three basic reasons. The first is an emergency fund. The second is for big ticket items, like a down payment on a home or a car. And the third is for retirement. And I'm going to spend the most time on the first and the third. Um, the emergency fund is it's critical. That, that is sort of your safety net. And the Consumer Federation of America, which has lots of excellent studies, has shown that the average woman in her 20s and 30s has about $2,000 a year of unexpected expenses. It's remarkably consistent across income spectrums and across the country. Yet the average woman in her 20s and 30s has $500 in savings. So right there, you've got a massive recipe for stress. And so it, the first thing you want to do is establish an emergency fund, ideally of at least $2,000. Um, but ultimately, your, your end goal is to save three to six months of living expenses um, so that you can leave a job that's not bringing you pleasure or leave a relationship that's not working for you or pursue hobbies or dreams that um, really make your heart sing. Um, but that emergency fund is really the, the first foundational step of everybody's financial plan. Um, the next thing that you're saving for, again, I mentioned were big ticket items like housing and cars. We can talk more about that later if you'd like. But the one that I want to jump into next is retirement because that's the one that people frequently don't think about until it is so much harder to do something with. And the best example that I've seen to highlight this is to contrast the experience of two different women. This is where I will refer to the handouts um, on page... Uh, uh, it's the PowerPoint that, that has the number three in the bottom right-hand corner. It says the money you save early on is the most valuable. So this is a visual depiction of two gal pals, Amy and Zandra. And both ladies save $5,000 a year for 10 years. But they do it in very different ways. Amy gets right out of school, um, and she's an engineer. She's making a fabulous salary for right out of school. She's making $50,000 and she says, I'm going to save 10% for my retirement right out of the gate. She does that for 10 years and in her early 30s she gets married, has triplets, decides, whew, too much complexity, I'm going to stay home with the kids. She does not spend that money. It continues to stay there and grow. She's got it invested in stocks. It's growing at 10%. Zandra comes out, she's working in PR, she's living in the city, money is tight. Um, she says, yeah, I'll start saving later when I make a little more money. She waits until she's 40 to start saving. And she also saves $5,000 a year for 10 years. At age 50, her parents get sick, she has to stay home with them, and so she has to quit her job, but her money continues to grow as well. Fast forward to age 65, Amy is sitting on $2 million. Zandra's not sitting on jump change, but she's got significantly less. Zandra's sitting on $300,000. So the point is, Amy has seven times more money, yet she saved the same amount that Zandra did out of her own pocket. And the difference was time. It's because Amy started early. So if you remember, only one thing that I say in terms of the three power steps to financial success, let it be this, that the three most powerful words in personal finance or start saving now. The money you save early on, even if it's 20 bucks a week, is the most powerful money you'll ever have because it has the most time to grow and compound. So usually when I talk about this, people are like, well, that's great, but I don't have any money to save. And here's where the, the tough love part comes in because Sharon and I have met people that can save on incomes of $25,000 a year and we have met people that don't have a penny in savings on incomes of $250,000 a year. So it's really about a mindset. Once you hit a living wage, um, and I, I say that very deliberately because 20% of our compatriots in this country are not at a living wage and, and that's a whole nother book and that's a whole nother very important issue. But if you're making a living wage, you can save money if you want to. And the best way we found to help people find the money to save is what we call a financial reality check, which is sort of our kind of hopefully more fun version of budgeting. So a lot of people think, ugh, budgeting, deprivation, you know, bring out all my checkbooks and my old receipts and dig through them, yuck. Um, and we say yuck too. So instead, we suggest you take a slip of paper, 
you pop it in your purse, and for a month, or two months is even better, you write down everything you spend money on, like a diet diary. And then at the end of the month, you pull out the list, and you take a look, add, add up everything. And if you're spending more than you expected, um, which is probably what's happened if you can't find money to save, then you have a little bit of homework to do, which requires two different colored highlighters. And with one highlighter, you go down the list and highlight everything that to you is a, a need. We call them foundation expenses, things that relate to your housing, your transportation, your child care, your insurance. We have a list of things that would constitute needs on a slide five in the, the lower left-hand corner. Um, so foundation expenses, you highlight in one color. And then you highlight your fun expenses, your wants, in another color. And what we found is most people, when they break out their needs and wants, and, and what you might consider a need, somebody else may consider a want, and vice versa. It's a very personal exercise. The point is there are no right or wrong answers. It's personal to you. Go down there and ask yourself, did, how, how much happiness did the different items on these lists bring to you? And what we found across the country is you know, you're going down your, your, your wants, and you find you went out and you had beer and pizza with a bunch of people that you don't even really like. Well, wham, you know, there's something you can cut back on. It doesn't take any joy out of your life. Or this one's a little harder, but let's say you, you love being outdoors. And you go down and you're looking at your rent, and you're like, dang, that's a big number. And then you stop and you think about how much time you actually spend in your apartment. You know, maybe you could take on a roommate or move into a smaller place. So the whole point is this. Your money you receive in exchange for work. So basically, if you get money in exchange for work, your money represents your energy. And when you spend it, you're spending your energy. And the point of the exercise is to maximize that spending so it's going towards the areas of life that bring you the most happiness and to eliminate the kinds of spending that go on in your life that really don't bring you that much happiness. And in going through that exercise, most people can find something to cut back on. One other thing to bring to your attention if saving money is troubling, and that's a classic leak in the wallet, which are credit cards. So credit cards are tough, because they can be your friend or your foe, depending on how you use them. <laughs> They're your friend if you use them for convenience, so you don't carry around wads of cash in your pocket. They're your friend if you use them, you buy things at the end of the month, your bill comes, you pay it in full, on time, because it helps you establish a good credit score. Where they get you in trouble is if you use them routinely to purchase things that you can't afford to pay for when the bill comes and you make just the minimum monthly payment. Because what a lot of people don't understand is when you make just the minimum monthly payment, mathematically what happens is you have just doubled the price of whatever you put on that credit card. If it's an average credit card with a mid-teens interest rate and a 3% minimum monthly payment, which is what the average is in America right now, if you buy a $50 pair of blue jeans, wham, 100 bucks. That's what they cost you by the time you're done paying off all the interest. So if you have credit card debt, don't beat yourself up. Tons of people do. But you want to try and get rid of it as fast as possible. And the rough rule of thumb is um, if you have between zero and $5,000 of credit card debt, you want to try and pay off an extra $50 a month every month on top of the minimum monthly payment and that'll get rid of your credit card debt depending on your interest rate in three to four years. If you have above $5,000 of credit card debt, you want to add another $100 a month on top of the minimum monthly payment and that'll get rid of the debt in three to four years. So doing the financial reality check and keeping a close eye on your credit cards are the two best things that you can do if you're finding it tough to find the money to save. So that's saving, and again, the number one thing to take away from that is no matter how small it is, start saving now. Your end goal in an ideal world is to save 15% of your gross income. So if you are making $30,000 a year, your goal is to save $4,500 a year. And of that, over the course of your life, roughly 5% will go towards your emergency fund and big ticket items and 10% will go towards your retirement. We'll talk about 401ks and IRAs in a minute. But 15% is the magical number. But if you're just getting started, that may seem insurmountable. So don't worry, that, that's where you want to end up. Just start. Um, it's kind of like flossing your teeth. I don't, I don't know about any of you, but I was kind of a late bloomer to flossing my teeth. And once I started finally doing it regularly, I was like, oh my god, how could I not have done this all the time? 
And it's the same thing with savings. Once you start doing it, it really is amazing. It becomes a habit. So start saving now. That's the first and most important piece of advice. I have a question. Sure. I don't have a problem with saving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You get so little interest. Like I could put the four thousand dollars, and then by the end of the year, um, you luckily to get maybe twenty dollars of interest. So where should where do you recommend that? You know, I'd like to know. You know. Yeah. I I have no problem with doing it, but even be putting money. But now you want to know how to make your money work harder. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that is the perfect segue to what I couldn't have asked for a better question because the next thing I want to talk about is investing. So now you've worked your tush off, you've saved some money, you want to put your money to work for you. So a couple things I want to talk about investing. The first is why you do it, the second is what your options are, and the third is how to pick amongst your options, and then the last thing is what kind of accounts to use. So the first reason you invest is exactly this point you're highlighting. If you save your money and you do nothing with it, it actually loses its purchasing power because of inflation. Inflation is the process by which prices go up. And the way I think about it, it inflation averages about 3% a year. And what that means, it does, may not sound like a big number, but after 30 years, it means that your money is only uh, half as powerful as it is today. So $1,000 will buy you know, less than $500 worth of goods 30 years from now. So it's like if you just put your body in bed for 30 years and then you try and stand up, you'd fall over because your muscles haven't been used. And it's the same thing with your money. So the reason you invest is to make your money grow and get strong. What are your options? You have four basic options. And I'm going to say them in reverse order of um, return. So the first option is cash equivalents, which would be things like savings accounts, money market funds, money market accounts, and certificates of deposit. Your second option is real estate, um, your primary home or rental properties. Your third option are bonds, which is just a fancy word for a loan that you make to a government or uh, an organization. Um, and in return, you get interest for a period of time. And then if the company or uh, government doesn't go bankrupt, you get your original money back too. And the fourth is stocks, which are pieces of ownership and underlying businesses. And how you choose between the four is actually related to your answer to a couple of questions. The first question is, when do I need to spend the money? Money that you need to spend in the next one to five years, it may be tempting to want to invest with it, but what you really want to do is protect it by putting it in an interest-bearing account that can give you the most amount of interest. You, you don't want to take money you know you need to spend in the next one to five years and put it at too great of risk because you know you need to spend it. And most of the other investment options, um, you need at least five years to have reasonable certainty that your returns after fees and expenses are going to be higher than what you would have gotten in cash equivalents. So what do you do so you can get more than 40 bucks on your money at the end of the year? Um, in cash and cash equivalents, the, the um, order of priority or the order of ranking is savings accounts give you the lowest amount of interest, but they have the most flexibility. Money market accounts and money market funds, and I'll tell you where you can open these in a minute, give you more interest but slightly less flexibility because you usually have to open them with higher minimums. Certificates of deposits or CDs will give you the most interest, but you have the least flexibility because they're for specified periods of time, three years, one year. Um, six months, and if you take the money out before you need to spend it, you'll have to pay a penalty. The penalty can be anywhere from one to six months worth of interest. My favorite solution right now are the online banks that are FDIC insured. Um, classic examples are um, HSBC Direct, ING Direct, Emigrant Direct. Um, because it's expensive to have branches all over the place, um, banks are trying to convince all of us to do our banking online. And in return for trying to incentivize us to do that, they're paying pretty darn attractive interest rates. Um, the three I mentioned, Emigrant, HSBC, and ING, are offering 5%, which is a pretty darn good return on your, on your money for cash and cash equivalents. So for money that you don't need to spend in the next one to five years, if you're uncertain when you need it, I would recommend 
um, an online savings account and getting that 5% interest. If you know for sure you don't need to touch it, CDs would be my next option because you can get good interest rates there. And if your local bank doesn't seem to have good rates, there is a website called Bankrate, one word, B-A-N-K-R-A-T-E, bankrate.com, which lists all over the country um, interest rates on various certificates of deposits and money market accounts. And if you forget anything that I'm saying today, um, all this information is also on our website, um, which is on the front page of your handout, on myowntwofeet.com. We've got links and resources to all these places that I mentioned. So money you need to spend in the next one to five years, you don't want to invest, you want to protect by putting it into the cash equivalent that will give you the optimal amount, um, the optimal balance for your situation between interest and inter a good interest rate and flexibility. For money that you can afford to leave and not touch for five plus years, that's the money you get to go invest with. And typically, most women feel really comfortable investing in real estate, and certainly owning your own home is a wonderful thing. But I would argue, and my co-author and I are trying to get women beyond your own home to start thinking more about stocks in particular um, for your longer term money. Because as uh, you can see on page, um, let's see, on the left-hand side of slide eight, we have a Xerox that didn't come out so well, but it shows the average returns over the long run of stocks, bonds, and cash. Over the long run, stocks have gone up about 10.5% a year. Over the long run, bonds have gone up about 5.5% a year. And over the long run, and this is the stunning one, real estate, which seems like such a great investment, and people talk about the tax write-off and you know these great returns, but real estate's a lot like a Labrador retriever. You gotta feed them and pet them. Like your house has costs associated with it. Property tax, insurance, maintenance, upkeep. And when you subtract all of those out, and those are costs that stocks and bonds don't have with them, over the country, on average, there are pockets that are different, and Boston is one that is a little different, but across the country, the average rate of return on real estate is actually, after costs, only about 3.5%, just a little bit more than inflation. Um, so the point is for your long-term money outside of your primary residence, for, for women in particular, stocks is a great option. And the, the only downside is that stocks are the ultimate roller coaster. We have 80 years of good data on stock market history, and while the average return is 10.5%, you might think that means in an average year stocks go up between 0 and 20%, and that's how you end up with an average return of 10.5%. It's not true. In two-thirds of years, stocks are up either more than 20% or they're negative. So it's these wild extremes that get us to this average. It, or said differently, um, in one out of every four years, over one out of every four years, stocks lose money. And that's why you don't want to put money that you know you need to spend in the next one to five years into investments like stocks. Um, even bonds, not nearly as often, but even bonds, depending on what's happening to interest rates, can um, put you in a position where you could lose some money if you had to access it um, earlier than you expected. So the rough rule of thumb is cash equivalents for money you spend in the next one to five years. For your five plus year money, um, if you are under the age of 50, Sharon and I suggest outside of your home, and if you can stomach it, put all of your money in stocks, all of your long-term money, which for most of us, unless we're really lucky and we're rolling in a big salary, it's going to be our retirement money. Over the age of 50, you're getting a little closer to retirement. You want to be a little more conservative. The rough rule of thumb for ladies is 120 minus your age is the maximum amount you want in stocks once you hit age 50. So at age 50, 120 minus your age is 70. You want no more than 70% of your money in stocks. The rest you want in bonds or cash because you want to have a little bit of buffer so you don't have as much time to make up for a loss if the market goes through a bad patch. Okay, so now you know you invest to make your money work hard for you. You know there's this dividing line between five years. Um, less than five years you don't invest, you protect. More than five years you want to go ahead and invest. Now, how do you invest in stocks? You know, a lot of people think, oh my God, I have to find the next Google or the next eBay. You could if you want to, 
But the good news is there's a power, two powerful keep it simple options that you have available to you that are really easy and actually beat 80% of the more complex options. And those are um, two kinds of mutual funds. First, let me tell you what a mutual fund is. A mutual fund is a basket of stocks. So rather than going out and buying, you know, trying to pick stocks on your own and find good companies and do the research, you can just buy a collection um, of, of companies. I think about it as a financial smoothie. You know, it's got a little bit of this, a little bit of that, all blended up together, and you just buy the drink. And the two kinds of financial smoothies that Sharon and I like best are called target date retirement mutual funds or index mutual funds. And let me explain what each of those are. Target date retirement mutual funds are like the financial version of the chicken rotisserie, set it and forget it. You buy the fund and what happens is, as you, and they have names like target date 2040, target date 2045, and the year of the fund corresponds to the year in which you're gonna turn 65. And what happens is the fund company will gradually shift your money between stocks, bonds, and cash to get more conservative as you get older. So literally, it is one-stop financial shopping. Um, the downside is the fees are a little bit higher than on option two, which is to basically mimic that yourself with a collection of what are called index mutual funds. Index mutual funds are preset collections of stocks and bonds. And they have very low fees. But you will have to make the, the choice yourself. So you could buy the stock index fund and just hold it up to age 50. And then after age 50, you'll sell some of the stock index fund and buy some of the bond index fund to keep your mix between stocks and bonds appropriate to your age as you get older. The benefit of that is the costs are lower. The downside of it is a little more work on your, your end. So it's kind of six or one half dozen of the other in terms of how involved you want to be with, with, your, with the actual a buying and selling of the investments you have. But target date retirement mutual funds and index mutual funds really are the two powerful keep it simple options. And in terms of where you do all of this, you either can, because again I said mo for most of us our long term investing is for our retirement. And so you can either do it through work or at home. And if it's done through work, it's typically going to be through a program that starts with a four. So the government has some retirement plans. And if you work for a company, it's called a 401k. And then they have different names depending on whether you work for a school or a hospital or you're in the military for, or a nonprofit. 403b, 457, these are other types of retirement plans. They all work the same way. I'll just use 401k to keep it simple. The way it works is if your employer offers this, it's great. You can sign up for it and money gets taken out of your paycheck before you even touch it and it gets put into an account and you get to decide from a menu of options that your employer offers how you want it invested. And what I'm suggesting is from that menu, you want to select either the target date retirement fund or the index fund. Um, and um, sometimes companies are really generous and they offer what's called a match, which means they basically give you free money up to a certain percentage of your salary. And if your company offers a match, you definitely want to contribute at least to that point. Um, but ideally, remember I said you want to save 15% of your income, at least 10% for retirement. If your firm offers one of these plans, one of these 401k type plans, that you can put 10% of your income in that and wham, you are done with that part of your savings. Very simple. Um, now, what happens if your employer doesn't offer one of these plans? No worries, you have another option. You can do it on your own in what's called an individual retirement account. So let's say you're in school right now and you're earning some money at a you know, working part time or in a summer job, you've got a little that you can squeak out to save. You can open up what's called a Roth IRA, um, which is fabulous. You put money into it after you pay taxes, but you never ever have to pay taxes on it again. You can touch it after age 59 and a half and spend it on whatever the heck you want to in your golden years. Um, and you can open a Roth IRA up at pretty much any financial institution. Sharon and I recommend the discount brokerage houses, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, and Vanguard are the three biggest. They have the lowest fees. They all offer these target date retirement mutual funds and these index mutual funds. So the key thing to remember is the 401k and the IRA are 
like picking a restaurant to go to dinner, when you decide to open your, participate in the 401k or open your IRA, you are like picking a restaurant to go to for dinner. Once you get there, you still have to order off the menu. So you want to make sure that you're picking a good investment and that's where the target date um, mutual funds or the index mutual funds come into play. I just have a question. Yeah. No offense, but um, are you representing these companies or no, are you just giving us the um, That's a great question. No, I um, am just an author. I don't represent any of those companies. Um, I personally have my money at Fidelity. Um, my dad has his at Charles Schwab. My co-author has hers at Vanguard. I have no affiliation with any of those companies other than I'm a customer of Fidelity's. Um, but that's an excellent question. And one of the things as you go down the road, um, whenever anybody gives you any kind of financial advice, always ask them the question you did. You know, what's in it for you? Why are you giving this to me? Why are you mentioning this? And if, especially if somebody's giving you advice um, for a fee, you always want to ask them, how are you getting paid? Um, so great question. I just want to make some comments about Roths since you just mentioned Yeah. It, is that Roths are very good for people who may be of low income or people who are very high income in particular because a high income person can't get the tax savings of a traditional IRA, although they can still put one in, but there's not much point to it. And a low income person doesn't have much to pay in taxes, so the tax benefit may not help them. But in either case, it's a good way of saving. Plus, unless they change the law recently, after five years, I mean, you don't have to wait to be 59 half. After five years, you can take the money out. And they can also be particularly good as a way of, let's say you're saving for a down payment on a house, you can do it in a Roth. You know, if you, you know, especially if you don't, not plan to do it for five years, it's a great way to save. Yeah, and uh, um, a couple points on that, and I don't want to get too technical and bore everyone. The, you can contribute a Roth IRA up to an income of about $99,000. The income rises every single year. If you have a pleasant problem of making more than $99,000 a year, the government will not allow you to contribute to a Roth IRA. Um, technically, you can withdraw money from your Roth IRA within five years to make a down payment on a home. I would strongly advise people to save for their, their um, housing outside of their Roth IRA because, again, think of that Amy and Zandra example. And once you start sticking your fingers in that Roth IRA cookie jar, it's just too easy to keep going back for more. Chances are, like I said, if you're in this room today, you could live into your 90s. You need that money. I'd rather see people <laughs> save for their home in a, in a, a taxable account on the side. Um, and, and that reasonable people can agree to differ. You know, Susie Orman, for instance, tells everybody to go take their money out of the Roth IRA for their house. And, you know, she's a multimillionaire and I'm not. So you can decide who you want to listen to. Um, but the main point is um, that they are very powerful um, vehicles. And if you want to learn more about them, you can literally just Google Roth IRA. Loads of people write about them, talk about them. Um, and we also talk about them in our, in our book as well. Can I see another hand? More than 99,000, yeah. <laughs> so if you have the pleasant problem of making six digits, you'll have to, as this gentleman rightly pointed out, open up what's called a traditional IRA, which doesn't, it has a different set of tax benefits to it. Um, but There's limits on those too, because you, you may not be able to deduct them or we will, well, you may not be able to open them. Again. No, you can, anybody can open a, a traditional IRA at any income limit. You may not be able to deduct your contribution on your taxes, but you will still benefit from um, the tax deferral of the compounding over time. Is there a cap on how much you can put into a Roth IRA there annually or something? There is, because of course nothing good comes for free. This year it's $4,000 if you're under the age of 50. Um, if you're over the age of 50, there's an extra catch up. You can put $5,000. Um, and next year everything goes up by another 1000 bucks. So um, next year it's $5,000 um, if you're under the age of 50 and then there's catch up provisions if you're over 50. And you can Google any, because tax law is constantly changing. So in any year if you forget what the number is, just go to Google and type in, you know, whatever the year it is, 2010 IRA contribution limits and it'll spit it out. And is there a penalty for early, I mean, is the five year an early withdrawal? Yeah, so there are like, 15 different types of IRAs. So I can't, I'm, I'm going to give a broad answer, but the broad, the basic 
idea behind IRAs is the government's trying to help us out by giving us tax deferral, but they don't want us sticking our fingers in the cookie jar. So under the vast majority of circumstances, and there are a few exceptions, but under the vast majority of circumstances, you have to pay income taxes plus a 10% penalty if you take out the money before you're 59 and a half. Well, there's another way to get around that too is you can, if you have a couple of years to do it, you can take your traditional and recharacterize them as a Roth and pay tax on it. And then, you know, then, you, then there's certain rules about that. That is true, but that's personal finance 201, which is mm -hmm. above my head, so we'll stick to 101 today. Um, I, I don't mean to get you off track, but what if you're, my concern is that a lot of students are um, on student loans. Right. And we're not making a living wage. Right. Even close. Right. So what right. are we supposed to do? Right. I, like, I want to start saving, but not possible. Yeah. No, I so hear you. So. The first thing is if you are in that situation, which most students are, the number one thing you can do is don't dig yourself into a bigger hole by trying to keep up a standard of living that you may see your peers doing and think is normal, but they're funding it off credit card debts. I think the single best thing you can do is first do no harm at this point. And then, you know, whether it's five or 10 years down the road, that's when you can start stepping in these things. I really can't emphasize enough. It's, it's um, it is amazing to me how many people live beyond their means. And so just trying to give folks who are struggling right now the strength to say, you know what, not going to do it. That's probably the best gift you can give yourself at this stage. And what about, I know a couple of people who have taken their subsidized loans and tried to put that into an account because it will bear interest higher than the rate of pay back. It's called arbitrage, and it's a risky game. I, I think I would, when thing in, in personal finance, simple is almost always better. When, think, when you try and come up, I mean, there's, there are no, there's, there's no quick buck out there. And so um, schemes that sound too good to be true usually are or involve a level of risk that most people don't want to take. You know what, I have to tell you, and I'm embarrassed that I'm discovering this as I travel around the country. Tax laws vary so dramatically country by country that I don't feel comfortable answering your question. But what I have been told is if you talk to or um, go to your consulate's website, that you can get reasonably understandable information about, about your options and the tax implications. Um, on a country by country basis. But in the interest of time, let me just jump ahead and just finish the very last bucket of things I want to talk about, I'll say in five minutes, which is about um, protecting yourself. Um, and there are a whole bunch of different ways. Some of them are very boring, like insurance. Because we're tight on time, I'm just going to talk about m my favorite way, which is in relationships. Um, so my co-author and I, we call this talking money with your honey. And really, the main thing we want to do is try and encourage women to do it. Because, I mean, I can tell you, I live in the South, and it is considered completely unladylike to bring up the subject. And I just got married at the ripe old age of 37, and my sweet hubby, I thought he was going to fall out of the chair when I, you know, brought the subject up. But what we suggest to people is when you find the one that you think you want to spend, you know, significant time with, move in, marry, this is, this is the person, you want to sit down with your... Um, sweetie and literally get financially naked and what what we suggest you do and it is totally unromantic but it is powerful is literally exchange a list of what you each own what you owe and what your credit scores are and the point isn't to judge each other it's just that fights about money are um, you know the number one cause of stress in relationships and the number one cause of divorce so you might as well try and fend it off by addressing it constructively from the get-go and you know what'll happen ho hopefully is you won't have any surprises but if you do you're a couple you can work on it together it doesn't have to be a bad thing um, but the point is to start the dialogue and it's also a great time to talk about things like how money was or wasn't discussed when you were growing up and you know areas of, of shared goals or different goals and the conversation doesn't stop when you get married. My husband was like, oh, man, we got to do this again? And the, the answer is yes. I mean, in an ideal world, you do annual minimum checkups as a couple where you, you talk about all of this stuff again. And you ask each other, have we met our 15% household savings goal this year? If we're not there yet, 
You know, if we're still paying off student loans, what kind of changes or trade-offs might we be willing to make? I mean, really talk about it. And for women in particular, there are a couple of things that we suggest. One, always keep a credit card in your name only, um, or that you're the primary holder on. And, it, and it's not because, I mean, God forbid, I, we pray nothing bad happens to any of us. But down the road, when some, if something does happen, you don't want to be in a position where you can't access credit because you don't have a credit history in your own name. And all you need to do to maintain a good credit rating is have one credit card in your name, charge something on it once a year. When the bill comes, pay it off on time, in full, wham, you've got your credit history. Start doing that right away. You've built a nice track record. If, if disaster ever strikes, you've got that. Second thing is if you choose to stay out of the workforce at any point in time, raising children or whatnot, Talk to your honey, you're working your tush off. You deserve retirement security of your own. The government says in order to um, contribute to an IRA, you have to earn money. So if you're a stay-at-home mom, you're working, but you're not necessarily earning wages from an outside um, source. And so for a long time, um, pardon my French, women who stayed at home, we got screwed. And so thankfully, the government has changed that. And now there are what's called spousal IRAs. And so as long as your household is earning the amount that you contribute, um, your, the, the, your household can contribute to the stay-at-home partner's um, IRA. So if you're at home, I, I encourage women to make that a big priority, that yours gets funded first. Um, and then the final thing that I always um, counsel folks is um, to be, think long and hard about consolidating any pre-relationship debt, particularly student loans, because um, while love may not last forever, student loans do. And that's the one thing, if you declare bankruptcy, you can't get rid of them. And so um, you don't want to be carrying around your ex-sweetie student loans with you. That is, you know, no one needs that. So those are just a couple of things to think about. But the really big point that I want to bring up, and, and I wish I had gotten here on time so I could talk about it more slowly and in depth, is everywhere Sharon and I go, this is the subject that gets the most visceral reaction from people. And it is so clear. I don't know that we have the exact right answers or the exact right information, but it is very clear that this is an area of money in our society that isn't appropriately addressed right now. There's a pent up angst about it. And so be strong. Don't let that happen to you. Talk about money with your honey. So that's my talk. Um, as you were saying about the credit scores, where exactly can we request them? Because I know some just send you history, not necessarily the number. Right. So excellent question. Credit scores are derived from your credit reports. I don't know why this stuff isn't simpler, but here it goes. You can get your credit report from annualcreditreport.com, all in word. There are three organizations that each keep a report on you, TransUnion, um, Equifax, um, and uh, Experian. And unfortunately, the data always isn't the same on all of them. It's a mystery why they can't get it all correct. But you, it's generally advisable to take a look at all three credit reports. But the report does not contain your score. To go get your score, you actually have to go out and buy it. And there are a whole bunch of different people that would love to sell you one. Um, the one that you want to buy is, is the one that's most commonly used by lenders. And it's calculated by FICO, F-I-C-O. And you can get it at myfico.com. Um, and fortunately, they charge you more for it. They charge $14.95. Um, and you don't need to order all three. You can order just one. Um, if you want to, you can order all three. Um, what I suggest is people take a look at it, um, you know, if they're about to make a, a major house purchase or a major car purchase about a year before, you want to take a look at it. Or if you just have no idea what yours is, take a look at it once. And then you only need to look at it when you're getting ready to do something major. But your credit reports you want to look at every year so that you can make sure that nothing erroneous is on them. You haven't been subject to identity theft. For free, the credit score you have to pay for. And it's once a year for free from each from each credit um, bureau. And a lot of people suggest that you suggest that you request one every four months, so that way you've got this kind of constant monitoring cycle. Um, other people are like that is too much. I'll just on January first or on my birthday I'll order all three every year. Six of one, half dozen of the other. Any other questions? Is there a score that's kind of ideal for some credit 
Ah, that's a good question. Higher is better. They range from 300 to 850. Here's the problem, credit scores are like sausage. Nobody really knows exactly how they're made and I honestly think even if we could know, we probably wouldn't want to know. So, and to top it all off, they're always, you know like they're like 14 different variations of toothpaste when you go to the drugstore? It's, there are all these different sub-variations on credit scores. There's like the traditional credit score and then there's extended credit scores and credit scores for people who haven't um, you know, own homes. There are all kinds of variations on them. But what you want to know is higher is better. Generally anything over 700 is really good. Anything in the 600s, it's a B. Um, and anything 500 or below, not so good. You're kind of in C minus, C and below territory in the 500s. And if you forget any of this, um, myfico.com um, also kind of has a little schedule up there that kind of reminds you what are, and it'll show you the different interest rates that you'll get for the different ranges of credit scores. You know, I was like an, I was a total nerd growing up. My dad taught me about compounding when I was 11, and I've just had this I, I like sick passion for personal finance ever since. I mean, my shelves are like full of it. And then I read Virginia Woolf's book, A Room of One's Own, and she says that in order for a woman to create, she needs money in a space of her own. And so, gosh darn it, I wanted both of those things. So I figured I better learn about personal finance. So I mean, I'm pretty much self-taught and one of the things I like to highlight because my husband um, when we got financially naked there was some stuff there I wasn't so happy about and so he said to me well I didn't go to Harvard Business School I didn't learn all this personal finance stuff and one of the things I like to point out is you don't learn any of this at Harvard Business School and part of the reason Sharon and I wrote this is because some of our girlfriends that were like I can't read the books that are out there they're too boring were our friends from Harvard Business School they're really smart ladies so anybody can teach themselves this all personal finance information basically boils down to save, invest, protect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.